Do you listen to music when you play video games? When you play video games, do you listen to the prepackaged tracks in the game? Or do you create your own soundtrack? Or does it depend upon the game? Do you play Super Mario Brothers with the classic soundtrack playing, its familiar theme song brain jacking you back to your childhood? But do you also play Metroid, same era, same console, with Philip Class Violin Concerto No. 2 on repeat? Do you stubbornly insist on playing Hotline Miami with the cocaine-fueled violence dance on full blast, but steadfastly refuse to listen to a single track from any military shooter, opting instead for dramatically ironic anti-war protest songs? No wrong answers here. Assuming the role of a maestro conducting the sickest orchestra, video game enthusiasts can choose the soundtrack to their double-barrel shotgun blasts and obsessive-compulsive ring collecting. Combining favorite games with favorite tracks may sound like a no-brainer, easily attained by randomizing the two mediums until they become one. But what about amalgamating music and games stylistically, oh so carefully, until the player could swear on their mother's life that this is the real soundtrack to Super Meat Boy? This boy has the meats, but he also has the soundtrack on vinyl. I love video games. I love music. I love combining them like Dr. Frankenstein sewing together body parts in defiance of God. And nobody can stop me. First things first, and this is the first thing, how do we do it? Most modern games, and even many pre-modern dinosaur games, come with an options menu that allows you to turn off the music but keep the sound effects. When playing a game with unrelated but artisan-crafted music, I keep the sound effects way on and the music way off. If I'm playing this game on my PC, which is how I play games 99.9% .9 of the time in the year of our Lord 2024, integrating the music is as easy as ice cream on pumpkin pie, which I will now buy at the supermarket today, having written this line during open store hours. When John Romero and John Carmack were programming Doom, one of them must have said to the other, Hey John, do you like Metallica? A totally cool and normal thing to ask in 1993, but a less cool and normal thing to ask every year afterward. And the other John naturally said, Of course John, Metallica will always be cool and normal. Why don't we make sure that Doomheads can play the Black Album through their PC speakers instead of having these MIDI files trademark sound blasted into their ear holes? Playing a video game with your carefully curated music turned up and the sound effects still on is my go-to playstyle for Doom and games like Doom. Sound effects matter. If the sound effects are off, determining the echo location of imps, demons, and zombies is impossible. Every shootable antagonist in Doom makes a distinct noise when Doom Guy approaches and comes within earshot. Demons that look like mutant pigs from a Pixel Graphics Pink Floyd album cover absolutely sound like snarling dogs and the long-distance incinerating imps are as vicious as snarling dogs but absolutely sound like pigs. I'm sorry, but the imp sound will always be oink oink to these sound-blasted ears. Don't hear me wrong, though. Playing Doom with the prepackaged soundtrack lovingly composed by Bobby Prince is the classic method of experiencing this game. Prince's work should be praised, our endless satisfaction his reward. Prince also composed the music for Doom predecessor Wolfenstein 3D and Doom successor Duke Nukem 3D. No shade to game composers. All love to game composers. But sometimes, firing a rocket launcher while listening to Call to Arms by Manowar just tastes different. Not always better, but certainly different. My favorite Manowar song is Manowar, but it's not from their debut demo album also called Manowar, it's from their first studio album called Battle Hymns. Playing Doom with a heavy metal soundtrack feels genre appropriate. The cover to Doom is reminiscent of a metal album cover. Metal is a musical genre that dares you to get into it and mocks you if you don't have the chutzpah. And that's what Doom is like. Because when you tell Doom that you've had enough Doom, well, Doom just derisively calls you out in front of the entire school cafeteria for the conspicuous absence of your own balls. Without this menu, a video game can only integrate music on the side, not vertically. Without this menu option, you have three choices. 
in-game music and in-game sound effects with no other music playing, in-game music and in-game sound effects with music playing over it in a kind of cacophony, or personal soundtrack without the in-game music or in-game sound effects by just putting the monitor or television set on mute. As an example, the NES Brawler RPG Mutant Hybrid River City Ransom does not have an options menu to turn off the music but retain the sound effects. If you play River City Ransom and you can't handle these funky beats because these beats are just too funky for life, the only way to protect yourself from funk overdose would be to turn off the sound on your cathode ray tube television altogether and miss out on the robust soul-pleasing bone punches and clattering coins. 1980s hip-hop pairs well with 1989 beat-em-up River City Ransom like Chardonnay and Salmon. I don't know anything about wine. 80s hip-hop mixed with Genesis stalwart Streets of Rage grants everyone who listens their government-issued license to ill. LL Cool J plus Double Dragon equals hours of fun, but again, you would be completely missing out on the crunchy and milk sound effects if played on everyone's favorite video game VCR, the Nintendo Entertainment System. That's why I play most old console games with the original soundtrack, chip tuning on loops, and approximately half of all new games, console or PC, with my painstakingly selected jams, bops, and slappers. Traversing a new game without the original music during a first-time playthrough is risky. What if you miss out on one of the all-time greatest game soundtracks? Sure, you could find the soundtrack online and listen to it in your own time, or you could play through the game again, this time with the deliberate, studio-approved score, but it won't be the same as experiencing the intentional co-mingling of audiovisuals in your virgin ear holes and eyeballs during your first playthrough. The game music is not random, it is generally composed with the visuals in mind. I have played Disco Elysium for approximately 250 hours, and I don't recall ever listening to anything else except the haunting compositions of a band previously called British Sea Power. Is it possible to get something meaningful out of the karaoke scene if we don't hear the detective's ancient reptilian brain voice or limbic system voice groan or screech into the void, respectively? But now... You are all alone. None of this matters. No, none of this matters at all. If a game has a fantastic soundtrack, then that soundtrack might be the best soundtrack, but it is still not the only soundtrack. Two years after the release of Disco Elysium, and only a few months after the release of the game's enormous update, The Final Cut, British Sea Power changed their name to Sea Power, eschewing the nationalism that listeners might accidentally take away from their music. This was their stated reason. Nobody likes a fascist. Disco Elysium allows us to turn off the music but keep the sound effects and the narration. Maybe a Soviet wave music compilation would be equally fitting. Or better yet, studio albums by Sea Power that were not written for the game. The aforementioned desperate karaoke song takes place in The Whirling in Rags, a motel, cafeteria, bar, and the only place in Martinez to socialize with your lonesome down on their economy neighbors. But Whirling in Rags is also a reference to a Sea Power song called Hail Holy Queen, which contains the lyrics, Whirling in Rags, in the opening verse. The karaoke song itself is a narratively modified version of a somber pre-existing Sea Power track, The Smallest Church in Sussex, a b-side from their single, Remember Me, from their debut studio album, The Decline of British Sea Power. It wasn't given a proper album release until a compilation years later. Sea Power song Want to Be Free was modified for the famous boat ride scene. But that's not all. Did you know that Tommy, one of the lorry drivers, is humming the same song? His lonely tune about being a galactic traveler is from Want to Be Free as well. The track is on the album Let the Dancers Inherit the Party. 
I did not know this until recently, as I listened to the song and thought the lyrics sounded familiar, not from another song, but from somewhere or someone else. The Great Skua on the Wall of the Whirling is a reference to the sea power song The Great Skua. There are a banana bunch more. We might never get a Disco Elysium sequel, or even another big update, which means we need to find new ways to experience this world for ourselves. Thus far, the game is pretty light on mods. Fallout exists in an alternate timeline that begins to heavily diverge with real-world historical events around the 1950s and 1960s, such as the 1969 reorganization of the United States as the 13 Commonwealths. In the intro to the first Fallout, we experience an ever-widening view of the post-apocalyptic wasteland, crunchy graphics, Captain Crunching Away. As this happens, we hear the song Maybe by the Ink Spots from 1940. Fallout 2 opens with the 1951 hit A Kiss to Build a Dream On, performed by Louis Armstrong. Modern Fallout games come pre-packaged with a number of tracks for the in-game radio. Fallout 3 contains needle drops mostly from the 30s and 40s, but at least one from the 50s. Fallout New Vegas contains tracks from the 30s and 40s as well, but it has more tracks from the 50s than Fallout 3. Merging the game's visual aesthetic and music together even more cohesively, Fallout 4 has multiple tracks from the 60s in addition to much older classical compositions, and Fallout 76 sucks. Unfortunately, as fitting as these tracks may be, repeatedly being subjected over and over to the same lyrics to Rocket 69 is not so nice. Good news! There are thousands of songs from the 50s that you can play instead. Turn off the radio, turn off the music in the settings, keep the sound effects and voice acting, and you can listen to your own infinite Radio New Vegas your own way. A variety of musical genres pair well and pair differently with particular video game genres. Classical music eases the frantic mind into focusing on the task in a puzzle game. We associate classical music with certain moods, certain feelings. Classical music inspires us to be great, to be people of historical importance, to be ancient. That's why college students listen to classical music while cramming for exams. Either that, or lo-fi beats to study to. Where was this studious cartoon when I was in college? Landmark puzzle game Lemmings had two composers. Brian Johnston, whose musical credits are primarily Lemmings games and has his fingerprints all over this popular series, and award-winning superstar composer Tim Wright, whose DNA is everywhere in the medium of games. Lemmings contains some original compositions, but it also features music from the worlds of opera and ballet. The track Can Can is actually Gallop Infernal, from Orpheus from the Underworld by Jacques Offenbach. Dance of the Little Swans is from Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. Dance of the Reed Flutes is from another ballet by Tchaikovsky, The Nutcracker. Lemmings contains Wagner, Chopin, and more. The problem with the Lemmings soundtrack is that it is forever trapped within the technological limitations of its time. Lemmings was an Amiga and DOS game from 1991, and baby, it sure sounds like it. How could this be? There is hope, though. You can just listen to the score from Swan Lake or Orpheus instead. If it was good enough for the composers of Lemmings, it should be good enough for the players of Lemmings. Lemmings on the SNES does not have an option to turn off the music but retain the sound effects, but Lemmings is not the kind of game that has necessary sound effects anyway. It does have good sound effects though, like this one. Hmm, that is a good sound effect. And that's not all. Have you ever played Super Mario Bros. with an orchestral soundtrack that a fan slash musician made for the game? Have you ever guided Link across the 8-bit land of Hyrule and in opposition to these paltry bits act out the story passed down throughout the generations, the very legend of Zelda, with full real-world orchestration? Because only weeks ago, Nintendo uploaded a nearly 30-minute concert recorded in Tokyo, the once and future home of video games. This concert is all Zelda, and it includes every single video game band's favorite live standard, the Overworld theme. 
If you know video games, you probably already know this, but both overworld compositions from Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda were composed by the same man, Koji Kondo. He was also the composer for Super Mario 2, Super Mario 3, Super Mario World, Super Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and many more. Mr. Kondo was hired by Nintendo as a young man, and he never left. Replacing the music in our games is never meant as an insult to the composer no matter how we do it, but replacing the music, indeed elevating the music in this particular way, is like hand-delivering the composers their flowers while they are still alive. These new versions are still their compositions after all. I highly recommend trying this with symphonic recreations of Japanese role-playing games. Revisiting Chrono Trigger, a game from my childhood, while sipping a cocktail that I would not have had as a 13-year-old in 1995, listening to the game's music in a manner that was impossible on my SNES, is like reliving my entire life with the emotions turned up to 11. I will now play the Lavos sound effect. Please mute the audio in this video if you do not want to hear the Lavos sound effect. <laughs> Final Fantasy VI is my favorite game of all time, but I only rarely replay the game that I knew as Final Fantasy III in my youth. When I was young and I finished a video game, I was pleased with myself. With great effort, I beat the game, as we said back then and I assume also now. When I finished Final Fantasy VI, I was not pleased with myself at all, because the game that I loved so much was now over. These characters had completed their arcs, and the story was done. Forever. I was 12 years old in 1994, and I cried at the end. It was my first Final Fantasy game. Later, when I saw the cover of a video game magazine about the upcoming Final Fantasy VII, I was devastated to learn that Terra, Locke, and my beloved Shadow would not be returning unceremoniously replaced by this double-fisted toaster delivery salesman with a haircut that could only be described as chunky. Final Fantasy VII was somehow, impossibly, not the sequel to Final Fantasy VI. That's just not how Final Fantasy worked back then. Nowadays, there is always a chance for a sequel, prequel, or even a remake, but to this day, Final Fantasy VI has received no such continuation. A pixel remaster is not a remake. It's the same game recreated for modern televisions and monitors with higher resolutions, but with a much worse font. The Final Fantasy VI pixel remaster does have modern game orchestration, though. The game's existence is worth it for the soundtrack alone, but the famous opera scene is a mixed bag of nuts. In the pixel remaster, Celeste is voiced by different vocalists in Italian, French, German, Spanish, Korean, Japanese, and English. That is also my ranked order of quality. I have listened to every version, because I am a freak. According to the magnificent composer, Nobu Uematsu, he wanted Celeste to have a kind of good enough singing voice, but not on the level of a true opera singer because in the narrative of the game, Celeste is merely impersonating the absent Maria. After all, Celeste is a general, not some opera floozy. I haven't been able to confirm this next part because I am not some game journalist, but allegedly, the sound team chose the Japanese and English singers under this amateurs-only directive, but did not choose the rest, and the rest were more seasoned performers.
In 1988, author Thomas Harris released his psychological horror novel slash alternative recipe book, The Silence of the Lambs. In 1991, a film adaptation was released. In the most wholesome and morally righteous scene in the film, Hannibal Lecter savagely beats the snot out of a police officer with his own weapon. As Hannibal Lecter turns babyface right before our eyes, classical music plays, juxtaposing his violence. This discordant melody enhances the scene. Maybe we can do that. Choosing a genre-specific, perfectly mixed music and game combination is all that and a tube of Pringles. Electronic music while playing Mega Man X. High-energy, high-octane progressive rock songs while playing Cultic low-energy, introspective progressive rock songs while playing Kentucky Route Zero. All good choices. But what about purposefully choosing a discordant melody instead? Something that radically changes the experience in another direction altogether. Playing a survival horror game while listening to They Might Be Giants may not ruin the experience. On the contrary, this may amplify the creepiness of the game. My god. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas. You can also have it both ways. Music that narratively fits the game, but does not stylistically fit the game, or vice versa, such as playing the 2018 God of War with the Frozen soundtrack. Nobody can tell us that we can't. Also, why not replace the in-game music if you just, you know, profoundly don't like it? I have a certain amount of affection for 90s adventure game Phantasmagoria, and that certain amount is 7 out of 10, but it tugs at my nostalgia enough to try to play it again approximately every 5 years. Sometimes I don't finish it, and the music does not help. Now the title screen music is iconic. Great job, no notes. It's a Gregorian chant performed by a 135 person choir, but it's all downhill from there. Nearly everything else in the game is plinky plunky background music that I did not care for the first time around, and then has the sheer audacity to repeat an infinite amount of times on a loop. I did not want to say anything too negative in this video, but there it is anyway. I am truly sorry, Mark Siebert, Sierra composer extraordinaire, but I can't be expected to love everything. If this music hits the ear wrong for you as much as it does for me, a genre-appropriate selection may be a soundtrack from a horror movie classic like The Exorcist, whereas a genre-inappropriate selection, perhaps stylistically wrong but narratively right, may be the soundtrack from Ghostbusters. Finally, one more variation on the theme. Why not replace video game music with music from another video game? How about Tales of Berseria with the Daydream Nightmare soundtrack to Near Replicant? Or something more discordant? At long last, with direct insubordination to the famous video game magazine ad, Genesis does what Nintendo don't, Sonic the Hedgehog can now do what Nintendo does. I hope that this has been enlightening, or at least not a waste of your time. I can already hear the comments. Why not just play the game as it was intended? And to that I say, I do that most of the time, especially if it's my first playthrough, and I already said that in the video. I said I replace the music roughly half the time with modern games, and far less often with retro games because of the inability to turn off the music and keep the sound effects. If I play 10 modern games and 10 retro games, 20 total, with 5 modern games with the original soundtrack and roughly 7 retro games with the original soundtrack, that's 12 out of 20 games playing the normal way. But there is nothing wrong with options. We should embrace having options. That's why there's an options menu. Hello everyone. If you are interested in rewarding my efforts, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash renegadecut, or you can just click like and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you soon.